Sir, can you please say your name and your job title? Me? My name is Brad Hodge and I'm a broadcaster for the Seven West Media Network. Oh, lovely. Lovely plug there. Uh, <laughs> I, I love that you went all in. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question, but it's a loaded question because uh, you've given me the answer once. Uh, would you agree that batting at four in T20 cricket is the worst possible place uh, to bat? Well, we've discussed this and there's no doubt <laughs> it is, yeah. It's, uh, it's not loaded. It's probably fact, actually. So um, I think if you went and asked every number four batter across all forms of cricket, female or male, they'll tell you that, yeah, the number four position is no doubt the most difficult and probably the most challenging for most players. Do you, when you said all cricket, do you, you think it's the same for one day and, and test cricket as well? No, it's probably the easiest in, uh, well, easier in test cricket, not saying easier because um, yeah. test cricket is just hard. Um, but one day cricket, it's probably the easiest um, in terms of that, you know, the, the field moves out and you've got a load of time. But, but in T20 cricket, the, the challenge is, is that, Around the sixth over mark, it's the only time where the game actually physically changes. So, you know, from north to six, there's two fielders in. From six onwards to the completion of the 20, you know, there's a maximum of five out. So the numbers four player generally finds himself often crossing over into those two spaces. Um, and usually, you know, you're only on less than five runs. So it's a real challenging state. And... And the number four is also governed by, you know, how the how the game's flowing as well. So, and we've discussed as well that most times at number four, you always come on and face the number the best spinner in the world. And you know, stats have shown that the top ten bowlers in T Twenty cricket, especially, are all spinners. And when do they come on? Outside the power play, the captain throws in the ball, and that's the challenge for the number four bat. So, yeah, it's really a, a tough position. And, when you think about it, probably the most critical, actually. You, uh, you, you are not an idiot. Um, that's that's the, the most friendly friendly way I could put it. But <laughs> I mean, you are recording this from a garage, so I mean, because you could work it out in your house. Um, you you have what PhD or a masters or something? Yeah, that's my point. A masters in business for management. Yep. Okay. Why bat it for then? Why not just say to everyone early on in your career? Because you were basically, you were there before, t- you're, you're that old, your career was that long, that you were there before T20 cricket. You're already well established as a legend in Victoria. And was it Leicester? You probably played your early T20 as well? Yeah, I played the first game of T20 cricket, actually, Leicestershire versus Yorkshire at Grace Road. So, I mean, that was a pretty, pretty cool event, actually. So there was a lot of hype in England around that time. And I actually opened the batting. Um, because we weren't sure about, A, how this game actually unfolded and worked. And truth be told, we won the title that year because we had two outstanding T20 spinners in Claude Henderson and Jeremy Snape. So, and of course, a couple of dodgy off spinners from myself. But um, bottom line was, is that, you know, we bowled 10 overs of spin straight after the power play. And, Everyone thought that spin was actually going to get crashed everywhere, but it was quite the opposite. I think Jeremy, you know, uh, economy rate of just over six and same with Claude. So, yeah, that was a long way. Those two went a long way to going towards the success of Leicester. Um, But batting at four, I think it's one of them things where, you know, traditionally moving from three, which is probably your best player in all forms of cricket, to four – in terms of T20, is a fraction more of a thinker, actually, and one that has to navigate their way through some real challenges. So one thing I've been thinking about a little bit about this position um, is that you, you, you basically have, you, you basically, it doesn't need to be in T20. It doesn't need to be your best T20 player, but it probably needs to be your smartest, most all-round batter. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so, and probably most consistent as well. And if I think about... Um, I think about one day cricket and in terms of looking at Australia, because that's where I am, you know, the, those that have been very consistent at number four, Michael Clark and Damien Martin, and they've had some pretty good players before them, mind you, but they set up the game so well through that middle phase. Often when 
it's challenging and and often slightly boring as well. But they're just able to manufacture their way through there and try and set it up for the back end heavy hitters. Um, number four in uh, in Test cricket, yeah, it's an interesting one as well because you know, often you find yourself in and around breaks, so lunchtime, you know. So it's such a challenging, you know, place because we know in Test cricket and, and long form game cricket that yeah. You know, Wickets fall around breaks, right? So usually if you go into lunch, it's usually two for 60, two for 70 or 80. You know, the number four is exposed to a couple of overs before the break. The opposition comes out, takes the field again, reassesses. So you feel like you're always under pressure. So, um, you know, when I look back at the history of great players, you know, those late to middle order players where they get through the new ball and just completely back ended, it's pretty skillful. When did you realize uh, in T20 cricket that it was a place that kind of suited what you did? Because if I remember, didn't you, you know, for Victoria, you used to bat at three a lot. You talked about opening the batting for Leicester at times. You weren't always like a number four, number five sort of player. No, because uh, Greg Shippard, um, you know, he was very much, he knew why number three was critically important and also number four. So when I played at Victoria, we had a pretty good number four in David Hussey as well. He was actually outstanding, A, eh? because he was a gun player at spin. So yeah, for three and four for us, we actually were able to complement each other pretty well, surrounded, around, surrounded with some heavy hitters in Cameron White and Andrew McDonald and so forth at the back end. But it was almost a luxury for the openers to go and play with some carefree freedom to know that the two players behind them not only were pretty skillful, but also quite good at mastering their way through tricky positions. So given the fact that we were very good or pretty good strike rates as well, you know, our momentum never stopped. If you have a look at IPL, you know, it's great to watch how you know, number fours walk to the crease and find themselves. You never get off to a fly. You never 15 off eight balls unless, you know, you're – Glenn Maxwell and you're trying to hit sixes and, and you know, that, that creates a different dynamic, right? But, um, you know, the number four, I, was, I had a look at the stats yesterday, I had a look at Manish Pandey and, you know, him chasing, you know, and always you, you, you're miles behind the strike rate, whereas if you're open or at the back end, you feel like your strike rate's always high. So with zero consequence, if you know what I mean. Um, mm. You can always go there and get out first ball smacking, but there seems to be a luxury in those positions where it's accepted. Whereas if a number four and five make those errors, it's like, oh, how can you make that choice at that state of the game? You know, it really is quite an interesting dynamic in short form cricket. So you were watching you play was one of the first times I really started to work out different ways of playing in T20 cricket and that there was more of a code to it than, than I originally thought because every game for Victoria, you'd be 20 off 20. And then you'd be 50 or 30, sometimes 50 or 35, sometimes 50 or 40 on a bad day for you. Um, but you would, always, you would always catch up, right? And that was a really regular thing. How long did it take you to work out that that's what you had to be? You had to bat it or run a ball, and then you could get in and start to hit boundaries later on. We just did a statistic. Uh, I think it was Shippy said that if I sort of get to the 14th over, we win 94% of our games. And it wasn't that I ever... He asked me to bat through an innings once, and it was the worst day of my life. I think I ended up 22 off 43 balls. Or We had a few superstars out. There was Cameron White, uh, David Hussey, who were playing for Australia. And he said, Hodgie, I need you to actually bat through the whole innings. And it just went absolutely pear-shaped because I went in such a negative mindset. And I found myself under huge scoreboard pressure. When you look up to the MCG and you find yourself striking at 70, it's pretty scary. There's nothing good about it at all. Um, but I think for me, it was it was an awareness actually and a wisdom which knew that there's so much to be gained at the back end with bowlers under extreme pressure. And it was almost like, well, if I'm at number four, I want to actually be a part of that process. And you sort of can determine when that process starts with good communication. It can start at 13 or 14. If you lose wickets or you think there's some good bowlers, you push it back a little bit. But yeah, for us, it was it was just a blueprint that we had for success. And I still think it's a pretty good blueprint, to be honest. 
When you went in the IPL, you batted later in the order. Is that because you, you couldn't master the number four position because you had trouble with the spinners over there, or was this another reason? No, that's not the reason. Um, but given the fact that, look, most Australians can't play spin right or effectively anyway to score, you know. But but it's 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 a it's not a true statement that because as I mentioned, if you have a look at the stats, the top ten bowlers in world cricket in T Twenty cricket are spinners. So it's every country struggles against good spin. It's not just Australians. So. Um, do we like quick bowling more than spinners? Yeah, no doubt, especially in the Indian, con- Indian conditions, right? Do we like facing spin in Australian conditions? Of course. It doesn't turn. It doesn't do anything. So it's not a challenge. My role batting down the order was pretty simple. Uh, Rahul Driver came to me and said to me, visually I was the only one that he'd seen face the likes of Dale Stain and some really seriously quick bowling and successfully hit it all over the park. Um, a lot of his youngsters that he had in Rajasthan, he said, if I expose these players who have never faced that before, they won't be able to cope with it. And he said, and I said to him, mate, you know, like I'm better. I'm, you, what you want to do is let me face 45 balls and I'll get you 70. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, I can get other people to do that. What I want you to do is to be able to win us a game when no one else can win it. So he said, you know, I like taking down Boomer or um, Lassie Malinga at that time. He goes, our younger players, they don't have a chance. You've got a chance. So that's sort of how the conversation started. And I was sort of pressing saying, you know, mate, look, getting up the top, like everyone takes away responsibility, right? So, but that's how it evolved. And it actually became quite fun. And it was almost like hero or zero. So, you know, like it's difficult to chase 14 and over, right, in the last four overs. But if you get it done, like, geez, it's a thrill. Um, and it's a lot more fun than pot- potting it around for five or six overs in the middle, I must admit, facing the best spinners in the world. So, you know, facing Sonny on the Rhine in the middle at Kolkata Night Riders on that old dusty wicket in Eden Gardens, <laughs> but that's anyone's nightmare. No one likes that, trust me. So you're better off uh, trying to whack some quicks at the back end. But, yeah, it was. I think that what you're seeing now is that the older generational players are actually able to think their way through the game a little bit better and find targets and matchups that they are very comfortable with achieving a 12 and for example. So I know straight away if I walk to the crease, not that I'm retired, but... If I did and I had Rashid Khan at one end and I had Brett Lee at the other, I'd back myself against Brett before Rashid Khan. That's just the wisdom over the years. Does that, that make me a poor player of spin? Not really. It's just that my confidence is far more stronger against Brett to get the job done than it would Rashid Khan. He's the best in the world, right? So that's how we sort of manage it mathematically. Let's take Rashid for seven, Brett for 11, and you're going okay. How much easier it is is it then to open? Like, what what is the? I mean, I remember uh, I remember talking to Mark Butcher once, and he batted. I think he batted number five and number six in a test match, and he was just like, "This is great!" Like, I've been opening and batting at three my whole life. Whereas in T Twenty cricket, it seems almost the complete opposite. If you're opening, that's almost the spot where. I mean, we saw Sun on Orion. I don't. I don't think. Were you with the Renegades when he opened the batting? I don't think you were. Yeah, you no, were I watched it though. Yeah, no, I yeah. saw it. I saw it enough. Um, <laughs> you know. Like putting him in that position, you're almost saying, look, there's free hits. We, we did it with um, Jimbo, uh, Rakim Cornwall in St. Lucia. We said, you, you, you're not going to put those guys in the number four position, but you can say to them opening, which is the complete opposite to how we kind of think of normal cricket, isn't it? It's completely different, isn't it? Um, a, you've still got to have the skill sets to do what mm-hmm. Sanon Naran does and Rakim Cornwall. Uh, they're pretty gifted players. And But having said that, though, if you asked any cricketer, to go out there and open the batting and play with complete freedom, what we talk about in T20 cricket, or chances are you'll get the job done, right? Because as I mentioned, there's sort of zero consequence apart from your own personal pride in your performance. But, you know, what, what do we say? T20 is sort of one in three, one in four really good performances. You know, that's a lot in cricket. So, 
you know, um, the people often get a little bit of, you've got more opportunity to do well opening than you do down the order. Why? Because you can actually you can choose how you want to play as well. You can choose whether you want to go out there and smack it from the start or whether you just want to play more of a technical game. Either way, you could walk off with 50 off 20 or you could walk off from 75 from 50. Both could be winning, winning performances. But the players that come in after that don't have the luxury of choosing. The game's already been set before them. So that's the way I see the difference. That's why everyone wants to get up the top. A, you've got a more chance of making a bigger score, but B, also you can determine actually how you want to play. When you're chasing 11 and over and the, the top order haven't done their job and you walk in at number five and you've got Rashid Khan at Adelaide Oval and you're facing 10s and 11s, you don't have a choice. You haven't got the luxury. to. to you, your fate is already determined by the scoreboard. So yeah, that's a complete difference. When you walk out and open the batting against the strikers, for example, you know that you've got six overs to make an impact before you face Rashid Khan. That's different. When you walk in and you've got to get 11s, well, you might as well not even walk out. You're done. So, you know, that's the difference. Talking about – there's a couple of other things I want to talk about. So one is the West Indian players, right? So they seem to – Fundamentally, you got guys like Kyron Pollard now, Nicholas Puran, uh, you know, uh, middle order sort of specialist batters, right? Like even guys like Darren Sammy, all the way down. They have guys who have traveled around the world, Dwayne Bravo playing in the middle order. Why do you think they specifically go towards those sort of roles? Is that a financial thing? Of they're just like everyone else is filtering towards the top and we can't compete with all the openers. Should we go in the middle? Or is it something to do with like Darren Sammy and Con- I mean, I remember looking at Darren Sammy's record, even at his peak, he he faced like one ball in the power play. Like he was just like, I'm not going in there. I think it's a good strategy. I think A genetics like the West Indies are just far superior compared to everyone else in that space. They hit balls further and harder than most people I know. Like, that's a gift, and you've got to use that gift. So for us here in Australia, um, you know, it's really interesting. We, Whether you're playing in Big Bash or not, everyone wants more exposure up the top. Mm. You know, take Mitch Marsh, for example. If Mitch Marsh plays in the T20 side for Australia, right, he bats at six or seven. He doesn't bat at three or four, but yet that's where they choose to bat in the first score because they think they need to get – X amount of runs, or that's where they're best used. Corin Pollard, when he plays CPL, as you know, man, he's a five. That's done. I'm not going any higher unless there's eight balls left. So that's the role he plays. That's what he's comfortable with. And and let's be honest, not many people in the world can do what they do. So you know, they they hit it to different parts, but with absolute awesome power. Um, you know, there's not many that have got that. The English have got really good tricks. Um, you know, they've got reverse sweep laps, but the West Indians, poof, absolute power. If if you miss a Yorker, she's gone. And that's their that's their mentality. Why go up the top of the order? Because they don't need to, because at the bottom, the balls bowl to their feet. Ah. They don't have to. Yeah. So that's the thing, right? When you when you play the last six overs. All you're facing, slow balls, Yorkers, maybe one bouncer out of 15 balls. And when you bowl a bouncer, most times the the field is set in front of the wicket because you're bowling Yorkers, right? When you bowl a bumper, you're going to be good enough to get a quarter of a bat on it. It yeah. creates chaos and it's gone for four. So put Kyron Pollard up to the top of the order. It's a completely different kettle of fish for him to be successful. But – what he does is outstanding. So you've got you've got Nicholas Peran, Glenn Maxwell. We're seeing like a change in in the way that people view number four a little bit, you know. And you and I have talked about this before of that we know how dead the overs are between six and twelve, and we, you know probably they need a bit of a shaker. Do you think there's going to be more guys like Maxwell and Buran like really attacking that? I mean, even Andre Russell's come in at four at times when uh, when the situation's there because you can really that's where you can make the biggest change in the net run rate or the run rate of the game, I should say. I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's a huge opportunity, and you know what you've got to do is is give 
if you're going to go down that path, then you can't criticise, right? Because Nicholas Perrin and Glenn Maxwell, Andre Russell, they're not bankers, right? They're match winners. So if they go in at four and they face one guy, Rashid Khan, and then try and smoke the next one out of the ground and get bowled, we can't throw our hands up in the air and go, oh, man, what was he doing? You know? But that's what happens. But if you're going to change the mindset, you've got to actually go in that mindset to go, you know what? He's going to fail eight to nine times at number four in IPL. But when he gets those other four to five right, mate, we're sorted. Because from if you think about it strategically, from seven, eight, and nine, what's the economy rate? About seven? If you change that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think seven, yeah. If, if that becomes 10... You're miles ahead of the game, right? So it is definitely a place where, yeah, you can change. Um, and if you've got the likes of – you've got a couple of Andre Russells, if you're lucky enough to have one at six and one at four, then my word, you're on fire. So, And that's potential. That's, if you look at the West Indies, when they won at Kolkata, but they were basically stacked full. It was only Marlon Samuels that actually was a, an anchor sheet, and he's still got some power, but – you just roll it out. Number nine, they're still coming hard. Um, it was a pretty cool, you know, system to watch. Yeah, I mean, if you can find, as you said a second ago, if you can find two Andre Russells, you're probably broke to begin with. But <laughs> <laughs> Very true. now on on the number fours, right? So my my theory is that it's a specialist position that if you if you're not going to go the Puran Maxwell Russell route, right? Uh, and you're, and you're going to pick a normal number four, that they have to be the most flexible in the batting lineup. So you lose two early wickets. You don't want to lose the third in the power play because your team will shut up shop. So you send in your number four. Uh, as you said, you come in the seventh over, Rashid Khan spinning it sideways, and you're just like, we're going to need someone sensible. But I think they're the player who should also not bat the most, if that makes sense. So, so Ajinkya Rahane, let's say you have him in your team because you think he's the most all-round batter and you think he's got a sensible head and he can think his way through all these situations. But you realistically only need him in specific situations. He needs to come in when there's two wickets in the power play. He needs to come in with Rashid Khan's bomb. Whatever the situation is, you have him. And this could be Steve Smith. This could be Kane Williamson. could be whoever you want in domestic cricket, right? Is, there, is, there a, is, there a, is it hard then if you are Steve Smith or Kane Williamson to be told, we only need you in these specific roles? Like, is that a hard thing for them to be able to accept? Yes, it is because they're the best in the world, right? And then ego comes into it. But you've got to be realistically realistic and say, you know what? As good as you guys are, you can't do what Andre Russell does. So you can't do what Kyron Pollard does. You can't do what Maxwell does. So there comes a time in the game where we need those in. I think what the evolution of the game will be is when coaches actually stick their hand up and go, in you come, son. It's time for you to park on the bench. Exactly like baseball, you know. Um, your job's done. Come in. I've thought about it many times, but I just haven't had the courage to be able to execute it. Why? Because, yeah, there's probably a whole lot of backlash. It hasn't been talked about before, but there's definitely a case where you, if you can see someone clearly struggling, you know, in you come. Someone else jump in and have a crack. It's not your day. But – Role specific in T20, it can only last for a handful of overs, right? Maybe two or three at best. Um, mm. and, and other than that, it's oof, you've seen off the best bowler, let's go. Off you come. So, you know, again, we try and find the weakest links. And if it's really an interesting point that what happens if you did, you know, just pull someone off and Ben Stokes walks in, you know, it's pretty cool. I'd like to see that actually. Uh, I mean, it, it's also, it's why you talk about the ego. So the one thing that I, uh, you know, I learned basically working with you at St. Lucia was how much professional cricketers are like club cricketers. Like I would have assumed that, I mean, there was a great case. I'm going to throw him right under the bus here, but Obed McCoy, when Pollard went to him and said, <clears throat> I want you to bowl from this end. And he goes, oh, I don't like that end. I'm just like, we don't factor in, I think, like, people who, who haven't played professional cricket don't always factor in that the human element. To say to Kane Williamson, mate, you've made your 18 off 18, you've got us past Rashid Khan, uh, now we're going to... There's a huge thing in that. He is one of the best players in the world, but he's not, obviously, one of the best T20 players in the world because he's not even in Hyderabad's team at the moment. Yep. It's an interesting point, isn't it? Uh, look, we're creatures of habit and we're, we're 
we're comfortable humans, especially if you think of the world of cricket, right? Pretty much now the modern young boy has babied his way through his journey from 16 going through the pathways of cricket all the way to professionalism. But he doesn't even know how to play an electricity bill by the time he gets to 30. So when you throw someone like that, a little curveball who's in this comfortable space, you have to be able to deal with it. This is why the best rise to the top, right? This is why when Ricky Ponting goes to India and he struggled against Habajan Singh one series, goes back and absolutely dominates the next, you know? Like, that's why the best of the best. Um, and the average of the rest of it, us mortals. But when uh, – I think a really good example um, – like, I, I gave that example to others when I got moved from – Rajasthan opening down to number six. Like it, it, it sort of, I questioned myself. There's no doubt about it. And that's what you do. But the great thing was, is that the whole drive had explained it to me, which, you know, didn't, there was no ego in it. He just basically said that this is the role and why, because actually you're better than other people to do that job. So if you explain something to Stephen Smith and say, mate, look, this is your role. Why? Because Man, no one else can actually do that. No one can nullify Rashid Khan when he's on a hat trick and, you know, we've just lost two quick wickets. You can do that, mate, in your sleep. So I think the message has to be critical as well. Just that, no, nah, you can't do that. You can't do what Maxwell does. You can't do what Russell does. No, no, they can't do what you can do either. You know what I'm saying? They can't walk yeah, in well, the I, first ball, just yeah. flick one around the corner and get off strike. So. Everyone's well, I think different. that's one of the things we don't understand about batting at number four. It's because it has the lowest strike rate, and we see the, the, the guy knocking the ball around for, for hours. And I think from the outside, and it wasn't really until you brought it up with me, I even really thought about this, but realistically, there is a, there is a specific skill set that is required, a specific temperament, and probably you know uh, maybe a, an experience level that you need. So you almost have to sell it to those players in that way, don't you? Of, you know, we can find someone who can bash bowlers at the death. We can find people who will play with more freedom than you at the top. Here is the thing that you have. You have batting smarts, and those batting smarts are handy to us, as you said, maybe for three overs, maybe for seven overs in a bad game, and maybe 11 overs in a terrible game. But realistically, that's what we need you for. That is your role in this team. You are the best all-round batter, and we're going to need you in an emergency. And I think that maybe so far, we kind of sell number four as the uh, uh, the anchor role and the you know the, the 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 less spectacular role. Whereas if you actually said it the other way, maybe people would be a little bit more excited to to be involved in it. No, they usually drop number four into a pile of dung, right? Because it, what happens is that they get past that honeymoon period of naught to six. The best spinner comes on, and I was just trying to get after it. But the player that comes in, which is generally the number four comes into this cauldron of pressure facing the best spinner in the world or the top 10 anyway, and it doesn't matter who it is. could be Shakib, for example. And you're still under pressure. And, you know, that's where, that's where it's really interesting that, you know, you can get away with a lot more at the top. Oh, I was just trying to get after it. You know, I got off to a good start. But that's why you need the smart because what happens if that person just walked out first ball and hit one down long on? He goes, oh, I was just trying to get on with it. Same thing, right? But one has more responsibility than the other. So it's, it's, it's a, such a challenging – We almost what we need to do is actually kick the opener back out there and go, you know what, try again. <laughs> 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 you know, see if you can get that process right again. I mean, if they get through, right, they're going to get 50 and 60 is great. But, um, yeah, we see it so many times that you know, the middle order player is just exposed. And what happens? Because the field's just gone out, the player makes a mistake, the field comes back in, which creates pressure, and then scoreboard mm. pressure as well. So it's a double. You, you have, uh, I mean... You probably lived longer in your life as a professional cricketer than not as a professional cricketer because you had the longest career of almost anyone ever. You had like <laughs> ridiculous, you had like an English 1920s gentleman's career uh, where it goes for about 25 years. Yeah, what about years. Darren Stevens? He must have me covered. Ooh. 
He might. But he didn't, you started when you were about I, – I still think you started when you were 15. There's no way you were of age when you came out to play for Victoria that first time. You, you, you looked like you looked like you borrowed your dad's pads, I, you know, and I was only a kid myself watching you, and I was even I was like, this guy shouldn't be out there. Shahid All that Afridi, noise. Like that, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, except it, it was like Shahid Afridi, except you were actually young. But he's, all he's that still no- 32 and up and coming, I'm sure. So I admire that, though. Like, he's done that well. It's beautiful. <laughs> that, oh, here's my fun Shahid Afridi fact. If you look at the uh, the game where he, he made that uh, world record score, it actually says that he's 21 on the screen. Yeah. And then later, later amazing, he was 16. He, he hit the ball so hard, he lost five years of his age. But <laughs> you've played all this career, right? Now now you, you know, do a little bit of coaching. I know you work in, um, in other fields as well. But do you think now, what, what, how would you be going about it if you were coming into T20 now with all of the experience you have? How would you play your role differently? What position would you want to bat in? Uh, I'd actually, I'd really focus on a, a power game with lots of tricks, like really try and, um, really try and work on the lap scoop uh, and, and, exploit those areas behind the stumps so and work on a power game which is really strong um i think you know as, as cricketers we just generalize eh? we just generalize right we go into the nets we just bat what we don't see is you know like i'd really love to see chris lynn actually become a lower order player because he's actually got the swing arc to be one of the best t20 finishers in the world he smacks low balls, right, and mm. smacks anything in his arc, pitched up. Like, that's a recipe for success. But that's something which we haven't sort of grasped in Australia yet, right? The West Indies have grasped it, but I love to combine some serious hitting power with the skills of – remember Safraz when he first came into mm. – um, I think it was RCB. He was a young kid. Yeah. And it was just like this extraordinary talent where he, I think he scored like 30 runs over the top of the keeper's head. And it was his first game. It just created absolute chaos, right? Um, so I reckon there's a, there's a real opportunity for someone to absolutely master, you know, that role. I, I still don't think uh, it has been. You're either that super big power hitter or you're a, you're a deft touch player. But to actually put it all together at once is still not quite there, I don't reckon. Brad Hodge, thank you very much for coming on the podcast, sir. Thank you. Thank you for working with me in the, like, 15 times that we had the reset. So good to see you, Jared. Love the haircut, mate. And congratulations <laughs> on the family too. Good stuff. Beautiful. Cheers, mate. I'll see you soon. Uh, take care. Bye-bye.